My sincere apologies for the delay. Uh, the system shut down, had to start up again, and also the change of venue. Uh, we got bumped by the anatomists, unfortunately. We had to have a bigger room down below, but uh, we got bumped. I'm sorry. So um, <clears throat> now I'll just try and put the lights down on that side uh, without turning it off, I hope. Because I'm a radiologist, I never feel entirely relaxed unless the lights are dim. <laughs> That's why it's uh, down like that. And I'm trying to get the film on that screen. Anyone can help me? No. <laughs> okay. In? Yeah. All right. So anyway, my talk tonight, uh, that screen will come up in a moment, I'm sure. Uh, <coughs> I'm talk the, the title, rather enigmatically, is Aladdin's Lamp and the, the House of Wisdom. It's basically uh, a talk about the uh, golden age of Islamic medicine, particularly, and the golden age of Islamic science. And uh, the reason for the unusual title, I hope, will become apparent in uh, just a little moment. The, um, I want to just to lay the scene by telling you a little bit about the, the spread of Islam, because that kind of sets the scene for the story that I'm going to tell. After the death of Muhammad in 632, the uh, armies of uh, Islam uh, swept out of the Arabian Peninsula from Mecca, and within 50 years they had recovered all of the territory that had been conquered by Alexander the Great 300 to 600 years before, 300 BC or so. And so they swept into Egypt and into the top of North Africa, uh, all the way up to Armenia um, and eastward to the Indus in India. The, um, the two main dynasties that I'm going to be talking about are the Umayyad and the Abbasid dynasties. And I just want to talk a little bit about them because they are relevant to the story that I'm going to tell. Um, essentially, the Umayyads were the first of the main dynasties and they occupied all of this brown area and then they extended into Spain and eventually they made some progress into uh, the west coast of France and they were prevented from taking over the rest of Europe really by a major battle in here in Tours in 732 where the Abbasid army was stopped by the forces of Charles Martel. Uh, <coughs> but they conquered and occupied Spain, which came to be called Andalusia. The Abbasid dynasty came after them, as I'll tell you in just a moment. But the first of the dynasties was the Umayyad. So uh, Muhammad died in 632, and between 632 and 661, there was a lot of internal fighting to uh, gain control of the new empire. Uh, but eventually, the Umayyads, who were a, a powerful family from Mecca, uh, gained supremacy and they established the first uh, caliphate, the first dynasty. And they established their uh, capital in Damascus. Uh, they started on a building program. The first of the buildings that they produced was the uh, mosque on the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, which is uh, a very... Um, significant uh, feature for both Christians and Muslims because it was supposedly built on the rock where Abraham attempted to sacrifice his son either Isaac in the Christian tradition or Ishmael in the uh, Muslim tradition uh, as it's uh, recorded in Genesis 22. And that uh, building, the Temple of the Dome of the Rock, uh, was fought over later by the Crusaders. That was the prize that the Crusaders want to get back from the Arab dynasties. Here's a picture down here of the Umayyad Great Mosque in Damascus. So they also conquered Cordoba in Spain. But uh, the Umayyad dynasty uh, really was essentially an Arabic one and didn't have the scope to uh, in, in sort of embrace other 
cultures. They were very inward looking. And so there was a revolt against them by the descendants of Muhammad's uncle, who was Abbas. Uh, and these were um, the people who formed what is called the Abbasid dynasty, named after Abbas. Uh, and there was, this is the root of the tension in the Islamic culture between those people who believe that Islam should be led by people from the inner circle of Muhammad, as opposed to those who believe that it should be led by a blood relative of um, Muhammad. This is the Sunni and Shiite uh, split that we don't need to go into. However, um, once the Abbasids had displaced the Umayyads, the Abbasid dynasty uh, expanded into the area of brown on my, my picture here. Now, they were a very much more dynamic uh, group, and not only that, importantly, they appealed to non-Arabs. They were embracing of a whole lot of other cultures, whereas the, Abbas the Umayyads tended to be inward-looking and really appealed only to Arabs. The Abbasids were determined to build an empire that embraced Christians and Zoroastrian Persians, Indians, uh, any group that came into their uh, uh, realm. So they really began what I'm going to be talking about as the golden age of Islamic science and Islamic medicine. They established their new capital in Baghdad. They built Baghdad in 762 uh, from scratch. And Baghdad is on the Tigris. And one of the reasons that they chose that was that, first of all, it's on the fertile plain of the Tigris. Uh, secondly, it's rather away from marauding armies that are coming in from uh, the Mediterranean. And thirdly, it's centrally located. Um, it's also on the Silk Route to China. It was a very lucrative trading route. So Baghdad was ideally placed to be the center of a very dynamic empire. And the centrality of that uh, location is important also because there was a considerable amount of, of commerce and trade with all of these eastern areas, with India, and with China, and with Ceylon. The uh, main, first main group of caliphs in the Abbasid dynasty were al-Mansur, who built uh, Baghdad in 762. The other well-known uh, one is Harun al-Rashid, a very dynamic uh, ruler, very enlightened, very keen on education and the acquisition of knowledge, and his son al Mahmoun, who uh, produced this uh, institute of learning called the House of Wisdom that I'm going to be talking about in just a moment. Harun al-Rashid uh, al uh, also developed uh, diplomatic ties with other countries. And you remember I said that the, Ab the uh, Umayyads had been stopped invading uh, Europe at the Battle of Tours in 762, 732. Uh, well, uh, Harun al-Rashid established dip diplomatic ties with uh, Charles Martel's son, Charlemagne, and that's a painting of uh, Harun al-Rashid me meeting an envoy from um, uh, Charlemagne, the ruler of Germany. So uh, al Mahmoud, uh, Mahmoud particularly produced this thing called the House of Wisdom that I'm going to be talking about now. You will have heard of Ali Baba and the uh, stories of the uh, Arabian Nights uh, in comic books. Well. This really uh, refers to Harun al-Rashid. Al-Rashid's uh, caliphate was, was magnificent by any standards. And um, he, he uh, spawned a whole lot of uh, uh, romantic, uh, mythical stories about uh, the life in his caliphate and his palace. And that's uh, the, the origin of the Aladdin stories and Ali Baba and so on. However, the centerpiece of this new capital uh, of Baghdad was the House of Wisdom. Now, uh, essentially, it was uh, a university, if you will. It was a library, a publishing house, a translation institute, um, and uh, a, a seat of learning. Its first head was uh, Hunayn ibn Ishaq, uh, 
who was a Nestorian Christian doctor. And uh, the way in which Nestorian Christians became involved in the Islamic world is, again, part of my story. It's what I'm going to tell you about now. But um, he was a very dynamic translator. And with a large number of assistants, he effectively translated most of the known works of Greek science and medicine from Greek, which the Nestorian Christians knew, into either Arabic or the more common local language, which was Syriac, uh, which was spoken in Syria. And um, down here there's a quote from the Quran that says, read in the name of Allah. The idea is that uh, I'm going to try and point out that a, a tremendously important difference between the Christian approach and the Muslim approach was that the Christians disliked science and knowledge. Uh, essentially, everything you needed to know was in the Bible. And as in the early uh, years of Christianity, there was a focus on dogma, church doctrine, the power of, of Rome and the power of um, the Bible, uh, and, and science and knowledge and medicine was considered to be a threat, basically. The approach in Islam seems to me to be quite different. They regarded knowledge and science as, as sisters of religion, really, and they promoted it. And that was a, ultimately a tremendously important difference between the two. And study really was seen as a form of worship. Now, so here is Baghdad, and you'll see that it is in uh, Syria, but uh, in this particular time, it's in the Sassanid Empire, which was in Persia. But when uh, the uh, capital in Baghdad was, was, was established and the House of Wisdom was uh, established, there was already a tremendous uh, repository of Greek knowledge in this area. And how did that happen? Well, Alexander the Great uh, conquered all of this area. And when he died, uh, three of his generals divided up the spoils and um, one of the uh, generals called Seleucus, uh, Antiochus, uh, gained uh, Persia and uh, the Arabian Peninsula and uh, this area, the Middle East. But he established centers of Greek society and basically Greek outposts all the way through Persia into the um, Hindu Kush and the margin of, Afri of, of, of India. And uh, so these were little centers of Greek knowledge and gradually uh, medical schools and universities or the equivalent of medical schools were set up in places like Nisibis and Jundishapur uh, and uh, Merv over here. So there were already centers of Greek knowledge uh, in that location that could be harnessed to provide teachers for the, the House of Wisdom. Now this was made accentuated by the fall of Rome and the division of the Roman Empire. In the first two or three hundred years of uh, our uh, epoch, uh, the Roman Empire was under tremendous stress, mainly by uh, migrating peoples coming from the Asian steppe, the Huns, uh, the Mongols, driving people, other people in front of them, the, the Lombards, the Franks, the Visigoths, uh, and they were all pushed into the boundary of the Roman Empire. They were all trying to get into the Roman Empire. And basically, uh, the empire became swapped. And um, in 284 uh, AD, the Emperor Diocletian decided that the, the empire was too big. It had to be divided in half, into a western half and an eastern half, roughly along that line. And you'll see that the eastern half, uh, which is now Turkey and a little bit of Greece, was spared the invasion of the Visigoths because they were turned back at the Battle of Adrianople. And then they made their way uh, through the Adriatic boundary uh, into Italy and ultimately sacked Rome in 478. But the result was that the Western Empire uh, of Constantine declined. It became uh, uh, 
dominated by Visigoths, and really it was the beginning of the so-called Dark Ages. The eastern part of the empire survived because they weren't under attack. The capital was Constantinople, and it was uh, the site of the growth of Christianity. Now, Christianity, the focus on Christianity was very important to my story because there was an obsession with Christianity and an obsession with doctrine in the Eastern Church to the exclusion of science and knowledge. And you'd have to bear with me to uh, go through uh, a little bit of the causes for the uh, crisis and the divisions that occurred in Christianity. And you may not think this is, makes one iota of difference, but uh, as it will appear, uh, as it will become apparent, I hope, it, there is an iota of difference. Uh, <coughs> Early on in the uh, Christian church, there was an obsession with the idea of whether Christ was truly God or truly man, or some mixture of the two. Was he kind of a God, but sort of a bit like a man, or the other way around? And the battle lines were drawn between the two camps. This was uh, the first uh, heresy of this the sort was called the Arian heresy, heres the heresy of Arius, who basically said that Christ was a man. He was sort of God-like, but he wasn't God. And so uh, the uh, discussion centered around the Greek term homo ousios or homoi ousios. Homo ousios means of the same substance as God. Christ was the same thing as God in every way, homo. Usios, the same substance. Homoi in Greek means similar or like, but not the same. So the other camp said he was homoios, usios. He was like God, but not quite. So the difference, that's the origin of the term, it doesn't matter one iota. In fact, one iota is very important. Iota is the little I, it's the smallest letter in the Greek alphabet. So very, very, very important. And so there was a council at Nicaea in 325 where Constantine, the emperor, uh, decided that um, <coughs> the, uh, the first homoousios was the appropriate uh, um, uh, term that uh, Christ really truly was God. Uh, and <coughs> Arius was uh, declared a heretic. Well, the argument bubbled on for many years. In fact, it's still going on in the uh, Christian church, um, resulting in the totally baffling uh, idea of the tr Trinity, the Holy Trinity. It's totally baffling to me. You know, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. They're all three. They're different, but the same. But they're all not quite the same, and it's all very complicated. And, and I don't think even theologians understand it. I certainly don't. Anyway, the whole thing came up again with a, another heresy of a man called Nestorius a hundred years later, and he said that because um, Christ was a man, Mary, his mother, was not the bearer of God, the Theotakos. She was merely the bearer of Christ, which is different, you see. So they had another council. And uh, <coughs> Nestorius, who was the bishop of Constantinople, said that uh, Mary was just the bearer of Christ, but not the bearer of God. He, he thought that Christ was a man, not God. But the uh, patriarchs of, of uh, Alexandria, Cyril, and of Antioch, John, believed the other way, that Christ was God. Anyway, there were very nasty church politics, uh, and at the Council of Ephesus, John and Cyril arrived first. Uh, they had their own council before <laughs> Nestorius had time to arrive, and they excommunicated him. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> so Nestorius and his followers, who believed that Christ was a man, but not God, they all migrated together with all their texts and the literature from Constantinople eastward. And they found their first refuge in a place called Edessa, which is in northern Syria. Uh, and the Bishop of Edessa welcomed them with all their texts. They brought with them most of the library of uh, Constantinople and most of the Greek texts that were of any use to anyone. So they had them all under their arm and they up and off to Edessa. So here was yet another influx of academics with all these Greek texts, namely 
Plato and Aristotle and Euclid and anyone who was anyone in the Greek scientific world, their texts were brought to Edessa. Well, Edessa eventually was thought to be a hotbed of dissent and it was closed down by the uh, then uh, um, uh, governor of, of uh, Constantinople. And so the, um, uh, the academics then migrated across into Persia to Nisibis and to Jundishapur. Uh, uh, Furthermore, you'll remember the Academy of uh, Plato in Athens. Well, it ticked along until 529 when it was finally closed by the then uh, um, uh, ruler of Constantinople, Justinian. And so all of the scholars from Athens also migrated east. So we've got this tremendous influx of scholars all finding refuge around Baghdad. And this was the group that was tapped into to form the uh, um, the House of Knowledge by the um, uh, Abbasid rulers. So Al-Mansur uh, and his, the son of Al-Rashid, uh, Al-Mahmoun, the son of Al-Rashid, uh, developed the House of Wisdom from this tremendous pool of knowledge. So they established uh, this uh, House of Knowledge. And as, as I've said, the Islamic world valued learning. They felt learning was a form of prayer that it was something to be fostered and encouraged. And that was the idea behind the House of Wisdom, Beit al-Hikmah. So it was sort of a library and a translation service. So all of the available Greek texts and the uh, Nestorian Christians had brought most of them with them from the library in Constantinople. They were all translated into Arabic and to Syriac, the local languages. Uh, and it was also a research institute for new innovations. They received uh, generous economic and political support from the caliphs. They were actively supported. They attracted uh, scholars from all over the known world, and they were centrally located in Persia. They attracted scholars from India, even from China, as I've said, from, from mainland Greece and from Egypt. So there were engineers and architects and administrators and astronomers and doctors. And at least one of the reasons why the Abbasid Caliphates wanted uh, such a, a house of learning was that they realized that in order to govern this vast empire, they needed well-educated uh, uh, administrators who were literate and uh, well-educated. And that was another reason why they stimulated and fostered the, the house of wisdom. So. There were vast libraries, as I've said, which contained all of the uh, available knowledge at that time, including, you'll see here, works uh, from Indian culture, the Sushruta and Charaka, which were uh, texts of, uh, of Indian medicine. And uh, Hunayn uh, ibn Ishaq and his uh, associates, he had a, a little army of associates, translated all these works into Syriac and Arabic. So uh, what I'm going to do is to just pick out a few of the notable characters that emerged from this uh, tremendous uh, uh, pool of knowledge in this new university. And the first I'm going to talk about is uh, Al-Khwarizmi. He's considered to be the thir first sort of theoretical physicist or, or mathematician uh, in, in history. He was really an astronomer, uh, but also a mathematician. Um, he developed the uh, algorithm and his textbook, uh, down the bottom you'll see, I've got a page from Kital, Kitab al-Jabr, and uh, that of course is the origin of the word algebra. Uh, so he developed algebra uh, and the word algorithm comes from a corruption of his name, so he developed the algorithm as well. He introduced decimal and numerals uh, into mathematics. He probably got the idea from India, but as I've said, uh, Baghdad was centrally located so that they could get all this information from the Indian subcontinent. And of course, the Indian continent was very rich in knowledge and particularly mathematics. So he introduced decimal numerals, introduced zero, uh, which ultimately came from the Arabic word sifre, uh, which uh, also gave rise to the English word cipher, and he introduced decimal fractions. So there was a, um, a flowering of uh, 
knowledge in all aspects of uh, physics, including engineering. Um, and so uh, here is a page from a book by Al Jazari. It's called The Book of Mechanical Devices. And it's a, uh, a water pump for uh, they were very interested in elevating water from one area to another area in order to irrigate fields. And so this uh, water pump, uh, and here is a uh, computer reconstruction of what it's thought to be like, uh, had water dripping into one tank, but at the same time having a certain amount of water dripping into another dish, which would then tip over, like this one here, and then swing the balance around the other, uh, the other way so that the other tank would fill. And there were a whole range of mechanical devices like that. They were very active in the development of chemistry uh, or alchemy. Uh, and in fact, although alchemy has a, been given a bad press, uh, thought to be sort of semi-mystical, in fact it really is the origin of chemistry. And one of the uh, notable characters is this person, Jabar ibn Hayyan. He was known in later medieval times as Geber or Jeba. Uh, and, but he was a very good uh, chemist, really. He worked at a lot of uh, aspects of metallurgy, developing uh, alloys uh, and techniques for uh, smelting metal. He developed glass. He developed the idea of glazing on uh, pottery to produce uh, some of the beautiful works of, of uh, Arabic art uh, in glazed surfaces. And uh, a couple of his words, um, al natrum, uh, ultimately became natrium or sodium in Latin. And uh, alkali, uh, of course, uh, ultimately became an alkali. And so a whole lot of these uh, Arabic words came from uh, uh, Jabir ibn Hayyan uh, in terms of chemistry. They were also active in botany, of all things. You wouldn't expect the... Uh, people of, uh, living in a desert to be interested in botany, but they were. Uh, and it was mainly for uh, pharmacy, for pharmaceutical purposes. This picture on the bottom is a pharmacist being consulted by a man who's uh, apparently got smallpox covered with the, these pox. They also were very active in geography, in mapping their region. And of course, the Abbasids were very keen to uh, have a precise idea of the extent of their lands and uh, the quality of their lands, and they really developed the science of geography as well. They used the knowledge of mathematics for astronomy. And uh, up the uh, top here is uh, a picture showing the phases of the moon, and uh, the moon is rotating around the earth, but in the same text, the earth is rotating around the sun which, of course, was uh, an idea that didn't come to fruition until uh, five, six hundred years later with Copernicus. But it was uh, quite a commonly held Arabic concept. So they also uh, developed the astrolabe. And this device here is an astrolabe. And you'll see a man uh, in the middle of the picture holding an astrolabe. The idea was that uh, you held the thing by the uh, hook at the top and you lined uh, a star or uh, a constellation up by sight and uh, twisted this thing around so that the sight line corresponded to the angle of the uh, object you were looking at in the sky. And then there were various gradations around the edge of the astrolabe which uh, told you which constellation you were looking at and the measurement and the uh, ele elevation and so on. So, uh, Islamic uh, and Arabic astronomy was very well developed. Now we're moving into medicine really and I'm doing that by way of optics because uh, one of the most important uh, um, uh, physicists and physicians was this man called Al-Haytham. Uh, in uh, later Latin text he's called al Hazan, And here's a picture of him on an Iraqi hundred, uh, 10 diner bill up here. We don't really know what these people looked like, so they're kind of fanciful drawings, but it's nice. So <coughs> Al-Haytham made uh, several very important discoveries. Uh, the first was on the nature of vision. Now Aristotle had said that we see things by having our eye send out some kind of vibration which bounces off the object and comes back to the eye. 
That was Aristotle's view. And in fact, it was the, the view of most people in the ancient world. Well, uh, Haytham did not agree with that, and he hit on the right idea that uh, it is light bouncing off an object that comes into the eye that uh, allows us to see. And he describes various devices like the camera obscura to demonstrate here he's got a pinhole with light coming in and showing that uh, light travels in straight lines and will produce an image on, the, uh, on a sheet on the far side of the camera obscura. So he demonstrated that light, passed, light uh, is transmitted in straight lines. He demonstrated that light uh, was reflected from the sun. Uh, he did a lot of work on refraction and really worked out the uh, geometry of refraction at, at, at water interfaces and at lens interfaces. Um, and here is a uh, thing that I don't fully understand. It's called the theorem of Alhatham that uh, mathematics students in this university still study. And it's to do with something that he worked out about the angle of reflection of a light beam on a curved as opposed to a conic surface. It's all very complicated. But anyway, he was a very uh, important physicist and physician because he worked a lot on the eye. So he, uh, this is a page from his text called the, uh, the Book of Optics, uh, where he describes the eye, and here is a drawing uh, to interpret it. And basically, he has identified the uh, lens, the atrius and vitreous humors, and the various layers around the eye. Not only that, but he's got another drawing from the same text where he's showing the two eyes and the optic nerves going back to the crossover called the optic chiasm at the back. And here is the optic radiation. So he had worked all this out uh, and uh, wrote it in his textbook. Well, he was very famous, and he was, his work was translated a lot in the uh, later uh, early medieval period into Latin texts. And this uh, is the front page uh, of a book by um, a, a Polish astronomer called Hevelius on the uh, position of the sun, as uh, called the Selenographia. But here you'll see on the left side he's got uh, Alhazen, and there is Alhazen, his name at the bottom of the plinth there. He's holding uh, one side of the title page up, and the other is Galen, uh, Galileo. And you'll see down the bottom, he's got, I think that's a picture of a brain at the bottom with Alhazen there, and he's called that uh, ratione, uh, namely the mind. He's attributing that to Alhazen, whereas Galileo only gets sensu, the senses. Anyway, so an important character. So in the uh, Eastern Caliphate, uh, namely the, the Abbasid area of uh, dominance, there were several very important physicians, but I'm going to just talk about two of them that the names will be probably familiar to, to you. One of them is called Raziz, and the other is Avicenna. So there is the name of uh, Raziz, is Al-Razi. Uh, he was born actually in Persia, uh, but as, I, as I've said, the Persian Empire had been absorbed into the Abbasid Caliphate, so it really was part of this new empire. He, like so many of these other people that I've been talking about, was really a polymath, a philosopher, physician, alchemist. He discovered sulfuric acid and alcohol, among other things. Uh, and he uh, also wrote on contagious diseases. He was the first to distinguish smallpox from measles here. And uh, that fact was recognized on the picture on the right, uh, which is the front page of a book by Richard Mead in 1747, I think it is, 1747. Richard Mead, quite a famous physician in uh, 18th century history, uh, he wrote this book in Latin called De Variolis, which is uh, on um, uh, chickenpox, uh, et morbillis, and measles. So they're the, the Latin terms for, chick for uh, smallpox and measles, I should say. Variolis is smallpox, and uh, morbillis is, is um, uh, measles. Uh, 
So he uh, recognized that um, Razis had worked on this, and down there it says, Huik Akeset, here is uh, attached, Razis Mediki into Arabis Kalur Birimi, a uh, very celebrated doctor among the Arabs, and so on. And so his main book, called The Virtuous Life or the Liber Continens, was very famous all throughout the medieval period and was used in all medieval medical schools. The other notable character is Avicenna that you will have heard of, I'm sure. Uh, his uh, Arabic name was Ibn Sina. Uh, and his book was even more famous. It was called The Canon of Medicine of, Abyss of Avicenna. And it was a standard medical textbook through all the, med the medieval universities up until the 17th century. Incidentally, our medical school has got a very nice copy of uh, Avicenna's um, uh, Canon of Medicine in English. Uh, there's another one in Latin in our medical school if you really want to go and look at it. It's really worth looking at. So he uh, wrote a lot on a whole lot of medical topics, quarantine, hygiene, sexually transmitted diseases, tuberculosis, diabetes, and um, his work was translated into Latin very early on by someone that I'm going to be talking about in just a moment. But this is the title page of his book, uh, and you'll see that the way the Latin is written, Liber, which means a book, and Canonis, they ran the uh, second, pa second line into the first. There, you see. I think, um, obviously, the typesetter kind of started off with ambitious... Uh, ideas, and then he got to the end of the line and think, oh God, I've run, run out of space, I've got to use a smaller type. <laughs> At least I think that's what he was doing anyway. Is that truly Avicenna? Who knows? We don't have any uh, pictures of any of these people I'm talking about, so they're all fanciful ideas. Okay, now at the same time as the Abbasid dynasty was occupying Syria and Persia in the east. The uh, Umayyads, who had been conquered in the east, were flourishing actually in the west, and they developed a western caliphate which came to be called Andalusia, Al Andalus. And they conquered most of Spain, apart from a few uh, Christian uh, strongholds up the top Castile and Navarre and Galicia, Pamplona. Uh, which kind of held out, but most of it was uh, Arabic and Islamic. And it became particularly famous for the beautiful architecture. And of course, when you go to Spain, uh, you will, I'm sure, marvel at the beautiful palaces and the beautiful architecture that you can still see uh, from the uh, Andalusian um, uh, Western Caliphate. Well, the most notable individual in the Western Caliphate was this man called Azorawi or Abukasis, and he was a surgeon, but what a surgeon, as you'll see when we uh, go through it. He wrote a lot of uh, medical things, but he wrote about ectopic pregnancy, which is uh, where a pregnancy develops inside the pelvis but outside of the womb. It's a very dangerous condition, leads to a lot of internal bleeding and uh, death if untreated. Uh, he wrote on de um, dentistry, childbirth, haemophilia, and also on ethics. Uh, <clears throat> he had a very long career as a surgeon, uh, maybe 50 years or so, uh, and he uh, appeared to be a very ethical man. He wrote a lot on ethics. But he's most famous for his uh, book here called Kitab al-Tazrif, which is a book of surgery. And again, we've got a copy of al Tazrif in English and in Latin in our medical school library. Really nice book because it's extremely well illustrated with all the instruments that he described, or he had drawn and he described them. Well, <clears throat> here are some of the things that he describes. And uh, those of you that are surgeons, I'm sure, will recognize the value of the things that he was the first to describe. Cocker's method of reducing a dislocated shoulder that is still used uh, in the A&E department. Uh, this is Walter's position for delivery of a woman. The idea is that if the, the, the uh, pelvic outlet is a little small and the baby's quite large, 
you put the woman's legs over the edge of a table and elevate her bottom, and the idea of pushing the pelvis up uh, springs the symphysis pubis apart and uh, increases the diameter of the pelvic outlet. That's the general idea of it. It's called Walsh's position. Uh, he was the first to use cat gut, and he described the ligature of blood vessels. Well, uh, 600 years before uh, Ambrose Paré described it, uh, you know, Paré, the French surgeon, was supposed to be the first one to describe um, ligating bleeding blood, blood vessels in amputation, but Albert Castle certainly did. He described ligation of the temporal artery for migraine. Temporal artery goes up the side of the head, and uh, it uh, was a, an operation that was pioneered in the mid-19th century by a French surgeon, but uh, first of all by Albert Castle's. He described reducing the size of unusually large breasts where they were very uncomfortable for a woman. He, uh, reduction mammoplasty is still performed. He described forceps for, for vaginal delivery well before the Chamberlains uh, described them in the uh, 16th and 17th century. Um, most importantly, he described primary and secondary wound closure. Now, all surgeons will know that in some cases when a wound is very large and uh, um, ragged, it, you have to leave it open for a certain length of time so that granulation tissue can form before you close it up at primary and secondary closure. Well, that concept uh, was thought really by most historians of medicine to have been developed in the 16th to 17th century, but not so. Albi Castles wrote about it. He also wrote about debridement of wounds, which means if you've got, he, he wrote a lot about battle wounds, arrow wounds and so on. If the wound's dirty, you've got to clean it out first before you sew it up. It's called debridement, and uh, that had not been appreciated before. And finally, all surgeons know that when they'd start an operation, or a lot of them at least, what they do is they get a, a, an ink pen and they mark out where they're going to cut, and that's common pr practice. Well, that was first done by Albuquerque as he describes the, doing that. Okay. The, um, one of the uh, most important developments of Islamic medicine was the development of the hospital called the Baimaristan, which means uh, a place for the sick. It's uh, two Persian words. Uh, now, these were very large institutions, and they catered for everyone in society. There was a moral imperative in Islam to treat the sick. It was considered part of your moral and religious duty to uh, look after sick, no matter who they were, no matter what their status, their wealth, and so on. So they were multi-ethnic multi institutions. They were very well funded, and they were funded by um, charitable trusts. The uh, local dignitaries set up charitable trusts that were put, paid into by wealthy individuals and, and, and rulers, and that was the way in which they were financed. The hospitals had specialist units. There were special wards for male and female patients, for patients with particular diseases like diseases of the eye or diarrhea or other particular problems that were common in the area. They had special uh, areas. The uh, centerpiece was a fountain, and they were usually built near a river so that there was a constant supply of fresh water for cleaning and for bathing. Uh, and the idea of cleanliness was yet another underpinning of Islam. I said that one of the important uh, tenets was study and love of knowledge, but cleanliness was also highly prized. It wasn't at the, t at the same time in the dark ages of, uh, of, of, of the West. Uh, so they were very well organized. They had morning and evening shifts. They had uh, attending physicians with medical students. And the way I describe it really could be describing a modern hospital. They had morning and evening shifts. They had outpatient departments. Um, they even gave the patients a small stipend when they left the hospital to get them on their feet before they started work. Um, there were medical records. Each patient had a little card indicating what was wrong with them and the treatment that was being given. That was an innovation as well. So the attending physicians were expected to do medical rounds and teach medical students. Overall, there was an administrator, and again, it could be a modern hospital. And this was a, a non-medical political appointment. 
who just saw that the whole thing sort of, uh, there was no jiggery-pokery going on and uh, kept everyone uh, focused. The caliph uh, appointed uh, an inspector and the inspector came round at regular intervals to make sure that everything was okay in the hospital and the patients were being treated properly. So they had an early accreditation system. And finally, they had almost no religious control. Uh, you may think that Islam was kind of going to dominate uh, everything in terms of its religion, but that's not the case. In these uh, Bimaristans, they had mosques for uh, Islamic people and chapels for Christian people. Many of the uh, Bimaristans also had employed poets and musicians to entertain the patients, which seems like quite a good idea as well. Well, we know a lot about these Bimaristans and the people that were in them, and this particular individual I'm going to talk about just briefly is important because he was the first to describe the pulmonary circulation, the uh, circulation of blood from the heart into the lungs and back again before it goes into the systemic circulation. Now this man was called Ibn al-Nafis. We know that he was a student in the Bimaristan, the al-Nuri Bimaristan in Damascus. Uh, and then when the Bimaristan al-Mansuri in Cairo was built in 1248, uh, he became the chief physician there. He was quite well known, again a polymath, law, he wrote on law and theology and philosophy and a whole bunch of things. But he wrote a textbook, and this is a drawing from the textbook, uh, describing the pulmonary circulation. Now, the pulmonary circulation was thought to have been uh, discovered by this man at the top there called Servetus uh, and or Vesalius and or William Harvey in the early 1600s. Um, but it is now known that the pulmonary circulation was, in fact, discovered by this man, al -Nafis. So, yet another of the achievements of uh, Islamic medicine. Well, the uh, Spanish Peninsula uh, was a seat of turmoil, and uh, although it was uh, predominantly uh, Islamic, uh, initially the Christian states at the top uh, slowly began to try to retake the whole of the Spanish Peninsula. That's called the Reconquista. It was a slow procedure, started off in about 790 and eventually ended up with the um, capitulation of the Arabic forces to Isabella uh, and Ferdinand of Castile uh, in 1492. But importantly, I want to look at the middle picture because it shows that halfway through this process, the top half of Spain was Christian, or predominantly Christian, and Toledo was in the middle. Now, uh, Toledo became a very important area that once it was conquered by the Christians because it had a very large community of Christians and Muslims and Jewish people. And they were all bi or trilingual. They all understood uh, Arabic uh, and Castilian, Spanish, and there was a tremendous amount of interplay between the two cultures. And a uh, school of translation grew up in Toledo translating Arabic works, and I've just uh, told you how all of this uh, new knowledge I was describing was, was, was produced in Arabic, it was now translated into Latin, and now it's going to become available to the development of the Renaissance in the, uh, in the Middle Ages. And the two main areas of translation of Arabic, all this wonderful Arabic knowledge into Latin, were Toledo and the other place of is Salerno that I'm going to talk about in a moment. But in Toledo, there was a very large number of translators, and here is one that is quite well known, Gerard of Cremona, uh, and he translated, he and his associates, translated most of the Arabic works into Latin, which then became available for the developing universities. And the other place was the University of Salerno, now, if you uh, look at this picture of Ro uh, Italy here, we've got Rome and then Naples and Salerno, which is just down below it. Uh, well, there had been <coughs> a, a medical school in Salerno from 985. Uh, but um, it wasn't very good until they got uh, access to Arabic uh, and ultimately Greek 
medical texts, and they got it mainly through the activity of another group of translators uh, headed by this man, Constantine the African, or Constantine Africanus, that you'll read about if you read about this kind of thing. He is an enigmatic sort of character. He came from North Africa. Uh, no one quite knows what his origins were. He was uh, a Muslim, certainly Arab speaking. He was probably some sort of trader, and he traveled very widely to India. He eventually uh, made it into, um, through Sicily, into um, the lowermost part of Italy, and uh, became a translator. He apparently learned Latin and became a translator for the school of Salerno, translating Arabic works into Latin. Uh, he then, interestingly, became a monk at the large um, uh, Benedictine uh, monastery of Monte Cassino. And you'll remember that the uh, monastery of Monte Cassino was destroyed in the Second World War, tremendous uh, battle between the Germans and the um, Anzacs and British as well. Anyway, uh, he became a, a monk there, and so he translated a tremendous number of these works into uh, Latin. And the most famous of his works is this one, called the Regimen Sanitatis Salerni, the Regiment of Health of Salerno. And this was, again, a textbook, along with Avicenna's Canon of Medicine, the major textbooks that were used throughout the medical schools of the Middle Ages <coughs> until the 15th and 16th centuries. So now all this Arabic learning has been translated into Latin, and we're ready for the development of the universities. And you can see that uh, these universities developed around this time, around the 1200s or so, including Oxford uh, and Cambridge. Well, it all came to an end, sadly, with the Crusades. Uh, with all four Crusades, beginning in 1095, they were um, the, the brainchild, really, of this pope called Urban, who was having a lot of political troubles at home. And as far as I can gather, decided that he would sort of focus people's attention away from the, the troubles in, in the West by uh, saying, oh, go and look at that problem over there. And so he sort of tried to galvanize you know, a very wild population into uh, sort of a force to <coughs> recover the Holy Land. That was um, kind of my take on the origin of the Crusades. It may be more complicated than that. But in any case, this ragtaggle army of uh, down and outs and uh, uh, dispossessed knights and uh, second sons and thieves and vagabonds and God knows what, they all made their way through uh, Eastern Europe into the Holy Land, pillaging and uh, and looting uh, and causing all sorts of mayhem on the way. People were completely horrified when the Crusaders came by because they just stripped the land as they went through. Anyway, they arrived in the Arabic lands and the Arabs were, or well, the uh, uh, caliphs were not very well organized initially, so they were beaten back, but uh, the Muslims eventually retook Jerusalem in 1187. Uh, eight, uh, the um, Crusaders made a couple of um, uh, sort of kingdoms, I should suppose, one of them in Antioch uh, and a couple of others. Uh, but ultimately, they were driven out mainly by this man here called Saladin, who was uh, uh, an Arab of a group that I haven't really talked about uh, before. Down the bottom of the picture, you'll see the Fatimids. He was a Fatimid Arab, uh, which is another group that I haven't really talked about. But he drove the Crusaders out. However, their troubles were not over because then the Mongols came and the Mongols, uh, the descendants of Genghis Khan, arrived in Baghdad with 150,000 soldiers in 1258 and they completely wrecked the place. Uh, it was said that uh, they destroyed mosques and libraries and palaces and it was said that the Tigris ran black with the ink of books. So that really was the end of Baghdad and the House of Wisdom the Mongols, but the ultimate uh, beneficiaries were the Turks. And there are two groups of Turks, the ones I'm talking about are the Seljuks. They were a pastoral nomadic group from the, the Asian steppe, and they'd often been hired by Muslim leaders as mercenaries uh, 
but they then uh, decided that they would uh, have an empire of their own, and so they conquered Baghdad and took over the Abbasid Caliphate, uh, and they really had uh, ultimately conquered most of the original Abbasid territory by about 1200 or so. Uh, they were uh, overtaken ultimately in 1450 by the Ottomans, another group of Turks. But the uh, Turkish uh, Muslims really carried on the tradition of learning and excellence that I was talking about. Well, what is the result of all this? Well, when you go home and sit on your sufa, uh, you are sitting on an Arabic word for a long bench. And there are any number of these words that we have talked about. Uh, so alchemy, alcohol, alembic, alkali, aniline, antimony, karat, elixir, jar, julep, syrup. They're all Arabic words and there are many, many more. Um, when we think of uh, our civilization, uh, people often think really of Western civilization. And maybe they think a little bit about the Chinese. They, they, were, they were doing okay on the far side of the world, but we don't really think about them too much. And we think, of course, well, you know, the wonderful Roman um, origins of Western civilization and the Greeks, of course. But what I've been trying to point out is that the uh, Islamic world had been uh, even more central to the preservation of knowledge and science and medicine with the uh, decline of the Roman Empire and people's fixation on Christianity and the hostility towards learning. Uh, in that time, between the fall of the Roman Empire and the Middle Ages, the Islamic world <laughs> preserved knowledge. And it's to them we owe a great deal of thanks, I think, to in preserving all of Greek knowledge, Greek science and medicine, and allowing the uh, Renaissance to take place. And of course, they were centrally located and were influenced by the Greeks as well, but also, as I've said, by the Indians. They brought mathematics and uh, numeracy from the Indians, Persians. They were also influenced by the Chinese. I've said that the uh, Islamic uh, capital in Baghdad was on the Silk Route, route to China. I didn't mention paper. That was yet another um, uh, innovation that the Abbasids uh, used in the House of Wisdom. They got, they learned to make paper from the Chinese uh, and probably again along the Silk Road from, uh, from China. So we owe the Islamic world, I think, uh, uh, a debt of thanks in preserving the knowledge that we now have. So, shukran. Thank you very much. Thank you.